a very good morning to everybody and a warm welcome uh, to and uh, to the tenth day of the refresher course uh, uh, for this particular session, which is on experiential education. We have with us Mr. Vishwas Parchure. Uh, he would also be assisted by uh, Madhavi. Uh, am I getting your name correctly now? Uh, Who is also from the same institute? Uh, Mr. Parchure uh, brings with him. 12 years of corporate experience and 31 years in the field of education with ch both children and adults. Uh, he brings to his facilitation a variety of experience from sales, marketing, teaching, training, peace building in communities, uh, both outdoors and through adventure. He travels with a play for peace uh, and uh, the desire to build uh, build uh, peaceful communities, which has taken him all over the world. Uh, similarly, his corporate uh, work has again sort of taken him to various parts of the globe, including remote uh, uh, places such as Costa Rica, Peru, etc. Uh, his experience and application of experiential methodology in the classroom uh, uh, over 30 years includes working with teachers uh, to have more uh, exciting classrooms uh, and travels into the outdoors with uh, children. Expeditions of body and mind are common practices in his uh, methodology uh, and he has uh, worked with uh, large groups and uh, enabled uh, I think a very different sort of look at education through experience. Uh, something that I think is a new area for many of us. So uh, we are looking ahead to an exciting uh, you know, uh, session, Mr. Parchure. Uh, before I hand it over to you, I would also request uh, our uh, technical team, Amit, uh, to please enable the uh, chat box. Uh, and to the participants, this is going to be an interactive session. Uh, so, you know, you could uh, type in your answers uh, uh, as and when you are asked to by the speaker. Uh, so, uh, with and, and if you can, it's a, sh a small request also from these, uh, from Mr. Parchure, if you could uh, keep your cameras on, at least some of you. I think, you know, all of us, we are all teachers, we know how horrible it is to speak to, you know, just uh, to these icons on the screen. So, if some of you at least could turn on your cameras, I think, you know, we would make this experience a little less alienating and disorienting than it is. Here's looking ahead to a wonderful session. Mr. Pachure, all yours. Thank you, Shivani. That was, <clears throat> that was a perfectly good request. So I'm going to make that request again. Um, I find it really hard to do, to talk to a screen full of names. So I'm going to request all of you to put on your cameras because then it becomes interactive, then it becomes interesting, then it becomes engaging. Otherwise, it's just another lecture and I avoid doing things like that. So I'm going to request you to please put your cameras on. Um, also, uh, do I have the share option, co-host option? Yes, have I been you, should that? Be. you should be. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Okay, right. Um, good morning to you all. Uh, some of you are likely to have bad connectivity, but whenever you do have it, please do put your cameras on. So, I was looking at your schedule and it looks like you've had a really full week. Uh, I'm glad I caught you on this day's morning. You're about to spend some time together. And uh, it just makes, for me, it makes perfect sense that uh, you're curious to know who this person is. And is, is there anything that you want to know about me? If you have a specific question, uh, please put your digital hand up so that on my screen I can see the hands, you know, it sorts it out so that the digital hands come into view. Um, I'm just going to give you a few seconds. Go ahead and put your hand up if there's anything you'd like to know.
And just remember that everything I do or say on this in this one and a half hours is really about the methodology that uh, uh, we practice in experiential ed and that we maybe should all practice. What does it feel like for you to sit there, and not know anything about me and, and struggle and suffer an hour and a half? And who is this guy? Why is he here? A bald head is not always a qualification. So can I assume that nobody has a question? I guess so. <laughs> okay. You can stop me anytime you want right through the session. Um, I want to make it as interactive as possible. So uh, again, request is to please put your cameras on. And uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Maybe that makes sense. <clears throat> I don't know if you've talked to a blank screen over the past one year. And is that, uh, uh, what does it feel like? And is it okay for you to uh, just walk into a remote classroom such as this, which has, if you've got a big screen, then you have 15 names out there. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they look like. You don't know whether they're interested, they're not. And seriously, I don't mind if you're sleeping and you've got your camera on. I seriously don't mind. But if you are there and you want to be part of this, my request is for you to put that camera on because then you're helping me. And if you want to be helped as an educator, maybe one of the things we all need to do is to get people to put their cameras on. So give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down or whatever it is that your answer is. Do you like talking to a screen full of names? I'm assuming you know how to use the uh, annotate function in Zoom. If you go to more, it's a drop down list. And you say annotate. And you can give me a thumbs up. There are people writing down. in the chat box though. Okay. I can look at the chat box too. All right. So a couple of no's, not at all. So uh, I'm just going to move on from there. Just remember that the degree of participation that you offer me will offer, you know, is going to affect um how i perform so i'm trying i'm trying to get you to stay with me there's a lot i have to cover i didn't anticipate this okay so uh, here's an interactive piece um we're putting a url into the chat box please click on it what's the ultimate purpose of going to school or college you can use only words and a maximum of three words is, I think, what we have uh, said it at. So, and it's completely anonymous. So those of you who don't like to be seen on camera, feel free to respond. There are not going to be any names out there. Uh, Madhvi, you want to take the screen? Yeah. Okay. You want us to click on menti.com and write this because I think people Correct. are writing on the chat box. Correct. So mm -hmm. click on the URL, menti.com, and there's a question there, and you have an option of typing in three words. And the question is what is the purpose, in your opinion, of going to school or college? Why do we send 
children to school. So just for your information, the larger the word, more people are using it. I'm going to give this a few minutes while people are still typing in. You know, just another thought. Here's a great way of, I was just thinking of look, looking at numbers and I'm saying, hey, there are 20 people have responded, 19 people have responded. We have 100 plus people uh, who've logged in. And uh, sometimes doing an exercise like this will give you an indication of how many people are engaged in there and how many people have walked away. So from an educator's point of view, it's okay, who am I reaching out to really? And I'm gonna make an assumption. I, I, I'm gonna give this another 10 seconds and then uh, we'll look at this. So what I'm really doing at this point in time is talking to about 20 odd people. That's okay with me. Okay, Madhvi, can you just give it another, if it touches 30 and then we'll, and then I'll share screen. <clears throat> okay. So what we're really looking at is why we send people to school is knowledge. I'm just gonna take the top five, knowledge, education, learning, interaction and fun. Would that be accurate? Okay, great. Thank you, all those who responded, thank you very much. And staying with me here, I'm gonna move on with the, with what I'm talking about. Okay. So um, I've been in this field of experiential education <clears throat> for about for about uh, thirty plus years. Uh, gone all over the globe with it. And uh, when uh, when Shivani said, "Hey, can you do something on experiential ed?" Uh, the quickest way to respond to that was to go to a book and say, okay, what are some definitions of experiential ed? And then use that and move on. <clears throat> I decided not to do that. And I said, what's my definition of experiential ed? If I've been in this field for that long, I'm going to take uh, whatever I've learned and try and articulate it. And this is what I came up with. I'm going to start at a different place. <clears throat> and that place is what are these, the truth, the three truths of what I believe of living. That the most time that we will ever spend will be with ourselves. <clears throat> so if you have an opinion, if you have a difference, if you have, want to add something, uh, feel free to stop me and say it, okay? Um, From the moment we are born till the moment we die, 
we will have what we call experiences. And all the choices that we make will be based on how we feel about things. And I said, wow, this is brilliant. So now where do we go from there? And how does experiential education really respond to this? And most of what I'm going to do today is going to be on the basis of these three elements. So if you've got a way of taking a screenshot, go ahead and I'll make connections to each one of these as I go along. Okay, I'm just going to go a little deeper into each one of these. Um, so you'll notice that I tend to use cartoons. And I, you know, I like to add a little humor to this very serious topic of education. So <clears throat> if we're going to be spending so much time with ourselves, it makes sense that we, we do something to find out or learn about ourselves a little more. And so one of the questions is, what do I want to become? And all of us, even, even at whatever age we are at, we're constantly playing with these questions and trying to find answers. And these answers change. The questions change a little here and there. But the answers also change as we go along. One of the things we constantly do is measure ourselves and a lot of uh, our personalities built around what we measure ourselves against. And therefore this becomes a really critical piece. When we set standards of measurement in schools, uh, you know this thing called 100? You know what I'm talking about? You know what 100 is? Are you there? Shivani, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. If you're there, please respond. What is, when I say this thing about 100 that we measure ourselves, what is it? What am I referring to? And if it's a stupid question, just say so. I'm okay with that. There's nothing in the chat and nothing in the voice. So it sounds like, I don't know, where is everybody? Okay. <clears throat> so how do I measure myself? Fear is a huge driver in our decision making. So what am I afraid of? What am I interested in? You know, at this point in time, I don't even know whether this interests you. And I find myself in probably a situation that all of us as educators find ourselves in as to, is anybody out there? Are they really interested at all? Or what are they interested in? And am I giving them what they're interested in? Or am I just doing my own thing? So here's what I normally do. I don't know whether you feel a sense of belonging to this moment as we sit here together or not, but I can assure you that I've spent a hell of a lot of time working on this, thinking it through, preparing for it. And uh, what happens on the screen affects me, is affecting me even now. And the question that I'm constantly asking myself is how is this affecting my being as I sit here and talk to you with about eight cameras on, everybody else is a name, I don't see a face, I have no way of measuring you, and how is it affecting my being and who I want to become? So, <clears throat> I have a choice right now, and I'm going to and I'm going to make it with you. Does this interest you at all? If it interests you, speak up. If it doesn't, 
then Shivani, I'm going to do what I normally do. Sir, yes, we are enjoying it, loving the slides and everything, loving listening to you. Thank you, Priyanka. And there are Thank some you. responses, you know, that it's not like there are few. I know, Shivani, I'm just saying, you've got a tough job, Shivani, you've got a tough job. And I'm saying, uh, let them speak up. You showed your interest by inviting me. I'm here. I'm sitting here. I'm I'm 100% here with you. But now the choice has to be made by the audience, whether they want to be part of this or not. And if they, is this what they want to become? Because I tell you what, uh, I've been in this field long enough to say that uh, the definition that people have of experiential learning and how it's being portrayed is way off the mark from what people have been trying to do and practicing for years, for centuries actually, across cultures. And uh, this, what we're doing right now to each other is not part of that game. But, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through my presentation like you are interested because nobody seems to be talking. One voice spoke up and thank you for it. I'm going to go through it. If you have a question, you will respond. You will engage. If you don't have a question, that's fine too. And I might not then take the hour, the time that I've been given because uh, a lot of this was designed to be interactive. So here I go. Uh, just a little uh, thing I wanted to say that it's not possible for them to respond in uh, uh, verbally they, because their mics are muted, so they can only type in the chat box. Okay, so here's my question, Shibani. Is it possible for you to open the mics? I don't not? think so. Not for everybody. No. It's, not. it's not. Okay, so am I supposed to then uh, pay attention to the chat at this point in time or all through the session? I can do that. That's not a problem. Uh, what, like I said, uh, you know, that normally what we do is we ask people to post questions in the chat box, which we take after the presentation is over. Got it. Or, you know, if okay. you have a specific question like you did a bit a while back and you want them to respond, then you will have to look at the chat box because they can't uh, you know, respond verbally. I got it. So there's a process involved. I'm going to follow that process. So I'll just go through the thing and then hopefully people will uh, make notes of questions and so on and so forth. Uh, just for information, I'm going to be sending this presentation uh, to Shibani so she will, you know, if you need the data. Okay, so the second piece, the truth is that we have experiences. I'm just giving you a, uh, a couple of seconds to go through that cartoon because, <laughs> you know, that's what it's all about. And we encounter this not just with our students, but also with our uh, children, those of us who have children. So, in most experiences, there is always an element of threat. And the word we often use in our response to justify response is that it was too risky or not enough risk, or this is element of risk. And the truth is that anytime we do anything new, there's always a risk involved. And that risk is at many different levels, at the physical level, intellectual level, not knowing the answer, the emotional level of feeling like you failed or you know you let somebody down or guilt or whatever. And at the social level where people are, uh, uh, you know, you're worried about what people are thinking about you. So there's always some kind of a threat involved. And the question here is for me is, what if we replaced threat with kindness? Is there a way of dealing with situations and expectations and even classroom scenarios, even assessments, which are seen as a huge threat in the system? Is there a way of dealing with it through kindness? The truth also is that we don't learn from all the experiences that we have, right? Nor is there necessarily a lesson in all lesson uh, in all experiences. And, you know, the biggest word in that word cloud when I said, okay, why do you think we send children to school? The biggest word was knowledge. 
and knowledge is delivered as content. Now, can we change any of that? So, you know, it's so easy to deliver content. All of us who walk into classrooms, we know that all we've got to do is to decide what the content is. And the syllabus tells us that, the education board tells us that, we just go out there and then we give it to them. And the assumption is that that knowledge has been received. But we'll walk into that a little uh, in, a, in a second. Now, the thing is, here's the thing that if you ask somebody, did you learn something from that experience? And usually the answer is that I learned not to do this. Because there, because there is no process that invites people to think about the learning process. We just want answers. What did you learn from that class? Or if I ask you at the end of this uh, session, so what did you learn today? Well, one of the things maybe, you know, learned not to put the camera on. I don't know. So this is what a great mind says, right? Interesting how knowledge is derived from experience, and then we, and then our entire education system is made up of a process in which we are delivering content information. Okay, the third piece, which is paid very little attention, is paid to this aspect of it in our schooling. Uh, and this is not just in the school, but at home as well. Have you ever felt that way? Like that character out there? Yeah. Yeah, every once in a while, right? Yeah. And all we want really at that point in time is a little affection, a little attention a little kindness. But it's always, almost always in a lot of cultures also seen as a weakness. Don't feel, don't show emotion. Now the meaningfulness from any information or knowledge that's delivered to us doesn't come from the knowledge or the information. It comes from our being able to give it a place in our own lives. And as educators, it makes sense for us to then say, okay, how can I make this more meaningful? When I walk into a classroom, I'm affected. I carry my emotions in, I carry them out. I carry them into every relationship that I have in the classroom. If, if the process is that I, that we learn in a community and not in isolation, and one of the biggest struggles during this COVID period has essentially been the fact that we are now isolated as learners. You saw how I responded, right? To no cameras on, I feel isolated. It was my sense of isolation that was responding to this and saying, hey, please, you know what? I want a sense of community. I want to see pictures out there. I want to see faces. I want to see expressions. I want to relate. And when we can't relate, then it does something to us. And it did something to me till Shivani very kindly, you know, explained that to me, that this is the process we follow. And I said, okay, if that's how it is, that's how it is. Now I'm okay with it. So that relevance becomes really critical to my learning process. And we all know this through our own experience of schooling, that when we connected with the teacher, the content became easy. We didn't love the sub, very often, you know, it's not that we <clears throat> liked a particular subject first, we liked the teacher and then the topic just became easy. We learn much better from people we respect, that we feel affectionate towards, whom we understand, whom we feel a connection with. So 
how much time as educators do we even spend trying to build connection? I was trying to build connection there. So I think we need to remember this, that emotions are the gateway to learning. How I feel is how I'm going to learn. Okay, this is just, uh, this is my perspective on where I think we are. There's this thing that we call schooling. And schooling is a process in which we essentially collect knowledge. It's all information. It's all, and I'm going to make the connections to the experiential learning cycle a little later. So uh, just remember this, why I'm... Uh, and then we're supposed to take that knowledge and when we're supposed to take it into life, and then that knowledge is supposed to be useful in our being able to manage our struggles and it's supposed to be the reason why we triumph in life, whatever triumphs they might be, right? And, so, and, some, and you know, people will say, hey, you are educated. You should know how to deal with things but nothing in my education has ever taught me how to deal with life. Nothing that we do in the classroom really teaches anyone, any of our students how to deal with life. Okay, and then of course it's the end and the hope is that we can hope to die satisfied and happy. <laughs> so kind of the irony of it, okay. So here's, I'm going to break it up in a little different way. I'm going to just call that whole schooling thing. So schooling is college as well, okay? So till uh, you're in some formal system of education, I'm, I've called that schooling. And pretty much the only thing that time is spent on is delivery of content. Now, here's the thing. The delivery of content is supposed to help us understand the concept. So, in physics, you will learn uh, the laws of gravity or whatever. You know, Newton did something, uh, an apple fell on his head and whatever, you know. But we don't throw anything. We just know it for a true fact. Now, the, uh, the, the concept of gravity completely separated from anything because the assumption that as teachers we make is that we know that if you throw something up, it's going to fall down and just get away from it. Otherwise, it's going to fall on your head. So there's that concept that we are supposed to understand. Uh, uh, you know, Pythagoras theorem or uh, uh, the circulatory system doesn't, or economics or whatever it is, there are certain concepts. And those concepts are supposed to help us function better in life. Now, here's what's completely very often missing in our delivery. There's no context. And unless there's context, the concept and the content remains pretty much in isolation. So I finish my schooling. Let's say I do something as serious as engineering. And then I go into the workplace and I am now an engineer. And I'm supposed to transfer whatever I'm supposed to have learned into a drawing that somebody asks me to make on day one. And I have no idea how to do it because I have no context. So whether it's biology, physics, chemistry, history, geography, economics, uh, finance, whatever it is, if there is no context, and that context, remember, has to be in my life, not necessarily, sometimes even case studies don't work because those case studies are somebody else's, they are management-based case studies. There's no, for me, I don't know what, I don't know what uh, some big organization like Google, how it's managing its finance or its e uh, economics. And, and therefore, there's this, this complete disconnect between what we do in the classroom and what life's about. Okay, so here's my biggest grudge. 
my biggest complaint about the education system that schooling, the time that we are in college, school and college, is completely separated from humane functions of sensing, feeling, being, becoming, and belonging. Don't bring your emotions into the classroom, we're told. Don't show them. Don't feel happy. Don't feel sad. Don't bring your anger. The funny thing is nobody leaves a dustbin at the entrance of the classroom and says, drop your feelings here. Maybe if we did that, you know, we'd become a little more conscious of it. But there's no dustbin. So we bring all that into the classroom and into the learning process. And none of the learning process so there's this complete, complete separation. Okay. Uh, I am reading the chat and I do read Hindi. So uh, thank you so much for your responses. I am reading them and I'm feeling a little more motivated to be here. Thank you very much. Okay. So if the purpose of education is to have richer experiences and richer lives, then I think, so this is my opinion, okay? I think schooling needs to be more interdisciplinary because life is not history, geography, and physics. We encounter them all together in the same breath, in the same experience. You climb a mountain and you feel gravity and you feel the rain and you feel the wind and you feel all that is going on. You know, there's biology, physics, chemistry, uh, history, you can, everything involved in that one experience of climbing the mountain, for example. And can we then approach this whole process through curiosity and exploration? Because then, hey, maybe we will die satisfied and happy. I think that's the ultimate hope, right? Okay. So this is, I'm just going to give you a glimpse into the what I think is the educator's world, okay? So And you've got, uh, if you walked into a classroom, you know what I'm talking about. All these expressions exist, <clears throat> right? Great, why? And the reason is this, that everybody walking into that classroom, not just us as educators, as teachers, but also our students are walking in and they're sensing things. And I think as educators, we need to ask, so those of you who are interested in what this experiential methodology is about, please do pay attention to that bottom row, you know, how will learners, there's a question out there, how will learners receive the experience? And what experience, for example, have I created for them? Am I gonna deliver content to a presentation? Am I gonna talk about it? Am I gonna tell stories as I do this? How exactly am I going to deliver it? And the question we're asking is, how will learners receive the experience? Because they're because the learner is constantly sensing the environment. If you are angry, if you are angry that day and you walked into the classroom, do you remember how your students responded? You can nod your head or give me a thumbs up, those of you who have your cameras on. Do you remember? And if you remember, if you don't remember, you know what, do one thing. Next time you're in person, walk into the classroom looking really angry and see what happens. Experiment with this. That one thing you do can actually create a powerful experience for your learners. Walk in one day smiling, dancing, listening to music. I don't know, man, shock them into it. Break some rules and see what happens to your learners. It's remarkable how immediate their response is. 
So why? Because they're sensing things. Now, the receiving, it's a sensory word for all of us, right? So, okay, so what's the, what's the value of this? When we sense things, it affects how we feel, and how we feel is going to affect how we learn, which is why emotions are the gateway to learning. Susan Kovalik has done some brilliant work around how emotions affect le the learning process and how to create safe environments for our classrooms. Our, ek, uh, there's a comment in the chat. Agar gussa, agar aap leke classroom mein jaoge, to ki jitna bhi can control karoge, you know, the human being is first an animal. Your students have the ability to smell your emo how you're feeling. So, yaad rahe ki aap chehre pe gussa control kar Lekin, aapke students jo mehsoos karenge, wo, wo sachi hoga. So just, just think about it, try it, play this experiment. It's really important. Okay, anyway, so why am I talking about this? The, this is the inner world of the participant, of the students. I just as you're sitting there and I'm trying to look at the faces and say, okay, what am I sensing? How are they feeling right now? Are they smiling? Are they looking bored? Are they, I don't know, but I'm trying to sense it. And one of the beauties of the COVID time and remote learning has become the ability to get 100 people or 49 people, at least on my screen, in one square foot, which is very different from walking into a lecture hall and encountering this, you know, 60 or 60 degree view and trying to sense what my audience is, sen uh, is feeling at that point in time. Now, why, why is this important? Because when I sense something, I respond to it. And I have this inner, and this inner world is a world of emotions and feeling. And try this because the day you show your anger, they will stay quiet, is my guess. And there is no art in anger. The art of anger is only on, on the surface. Anger inside is going to reach anger outside. There is no scenario in life in which that does not happen. And that's true with joy and happiness and sadness. Everything. So walk into the classroom, you know, the better experiment instead of anger, because, you know, most kids are scared anyway. A better experiment is walk in with joy. Listen to your best song seconds before you walk into the classroom so you're alive. Walk in there and see what it does to your students. Don't say a word. Just, they will sense your energy and it'll do something for them. And if you are, now here's the point, if you are not emotionally engaged at present in what you're doing, your students are going to reflect that. Okay, so what are these inner parts? One is emotions. The other is how are people receiving what you do? And the third is, do I even have an idea as to what I want, what my students want to be or become in their lives? And you know what? This is what I call the no control zone. You have absolutely no control over how people receive what you do. Like I have no control right now about how you're receiving me. The only thing I can do is to say, hey, look, you know what? I'm going to be, I'm going to talk about stuff because I love it. I'm going to be there completely. And hopefully this energy will go out there 
and influence you and how you are feeling at this point in time. Most of our lives, we are trying to control this. No chance. Okay. So think about it. Later you can you know, you have you have access to this. So what do we have control over? This is what we have control over. We have control over the outer world. We may have control over where the learning takes place. On a particular day, or generally, if the rule is classroom, then I don't know, may I have a standing lecture or something like that, where everybody stands and the teacher sits. Reverse roles. Throw whiteboards, blackboards, whatever, across the entire room, for example, instead of making it lecture style. What if you had um, flip charts all over and you got people to work in groups? We have control over that. We have control over the methodology of the place. And we have control over what they do. Uh, you want more of this? This comes from Colin Beard's book, The Power of Experiential Learning. Um, I think it's available in Amazon. Brilliant book. Great. So, just so why did I do this? Just remember what we have, where we have control, and where we do not have control. Okay. So, in the experiential world. A lot of people think it's all adventure. Not necessarily. You can have adventure in the classroom. Incidentally, there's a book written by Laurie Frank, which is titled Adventure in the Classroom. It gives you a wonderful insight into uh, how you can bring the spirit of adventure, curiosity, learning, unknown, into the classroom. But, the, but this is just the gist of the types of activities that we use in the experiential world. I know some of you are engaged enough to take pictures of this. I can see you do that. Don't waste your time. I'm going to give it to you anyway. But if that's your style, just go ahead, okay? I don't want to stop you. Okay. so. There's a lot of stuff in this. So I'm just going to give you some visual clues into what we're talking about. You know what the word cognitive means, right? And this is the usual response. But you can make it more interesting by using metaphors, deductive reasoning, and brainstorming. We call it homework in the education system, which is another threat because if you don't do homework, oh, big problem. Dramatization, music, poetry, constructing, building something, deconstructing, dismantling something. These are all wonderful ways and not necessarily always things, you can also give them a case study and ask them to dismantle it. So construction and deconstruction can also be cognitive. Physical. Then you have, you know, games used for connection, for building relationships, often referred to as team building games. Then you have group initiatives, which is you give them a task to resolve or a problem to solve, and then they go about thinking through it and then delivering it. And it brings up all the human issues that we're really gonna be dealing with through life. And the die happy and satisfied really comes from all this, not from becoming a PhD. So 
you know, 180 degree views of the world, of the sky. Now we live so much in cities that we hardly get to see that view. It's like, oh, the next building is 10 feet away and that's it. And it's doing something to our vision as well. Just remember that. And then, of course, something that scares the hell out of you, you know, throw you off a cliff or make you walk on a pole 40 feet in the air. It all does something for us. Okay, so that's just a jalap. Now, here's the meat of what I want to do today, and it is... I have half an hour, uh, so I'm going to run through this. Uh, the basic premise is this. And the most popularly used learning cycle used in the experiential world is Kolb's cycle. Experiential learning cycle, David Kolb's experiential learning cycle, which he breaks up sorry, into I four interrupting Company. you to say that yes. you have half a uh, time till one o'clock but that includes time for any question and answers so just uh if you could keep that in mind got it so what i'll do is i'll run run you through an entire life in 10 minutes <laughs> and then if you have questions then we can go back to it okay my 10 minutes starts now right so learning happens in four aspects through feeling so I'm going to forget the text. Just pay attention to the words. Through watching. So reflection being a critical part of the process. Through thinking. And this is what most of education is around. We just ask people to think. So feelings are not important. Watching is not important. I want you to just think, look at a book and answer those questions. And the fourth piece is doing. Now, some of you know that, uh, I mean, think about how you, when you bought your first telephone, did you hit the button straight away and learn, or did you go to a manual and read and then go back? And you'll notice that all of us have very different styles of learning. So the entire process of learning one way of looking at it is feeling, watching, thinking, and doing. Now, I just want to I, I just want to separate words that are off are being used in a huge way in the education world right now. NEP talking about experiential learning, and I don't and I don't buy that idea at all because theoretically, experiential learning is just the experience, which is supposed to be delivery of content and watching. This is experiential learning. So asking a lot of questions. So asking, getting, using processes to get students to reflect and think about what we've done or what we've taught is supposed to be the additional piece. But this is neither here nor there. And we need to really complete the cycle by adding these two pieces. And this is experiential education when you go through the entire cycle. So here's the point I'm trying to make. This can happen in a classroom. And this is what people are trying to do, but it's not enough because unless it's connected to, this is where the connections happen. So you teach economics or history, and if you can't, if we can't get them to think about wh what the value of history is, then you know we've missed the point. They will never know this, which is why people are so disinterested in history. For example, because we teach history as a bunch of dates, by and large, but what's the relevance of what somebody did 400 years ago? How, what lessons are there for us to learn? This is the abstract concept that we are trying to get them to connect to their lives. And then we get them to do something about it. So 
these are the four stages that are critical in the experiential learning process. This is another way of looking at it. That one is as teachers, us delivering stuff. But of greater importance of the code cycle is the fact that he says that, look, you know what? These are four things you can do. Get them to feel, get them to watch, get them to think, and get them to do stuff. But these are not just delivery methods for us as teachers, that even as students, we lean on some styles of learning more than others, which means that you have, so just very briefly, how we deal with an experience, how we receive an experience is through feeling and thinking. And how we deal with an experience or respond to an experience is through doing or watching. And so you actually have, so this is a lot of text. I'm going to leave it for you. It offers you, for example, the instructional technique will give you some insight into what you could do when you recognize that you have a particular type of learner in your audience. But the best way to do it is to introduce a topic using all four styles. And that is really the methodology of experiential education. And so I'm going to stop here because uh, if you have questions, or do I have five minutes? Okay, I've got five minutes. I'm going to use them. What I do want to share with you is what I did. So how it applies. And this is how I taught geography using the cold cycle. So it didn't begin by my saying, we're going to learn this. We started with basically defining boundaries for the educator and defining boundaries for the learner. So there are two elements that are critical in any learning process. Where do we want to get to? And how are we going to get there? Okay, so now this is how it happened there in that classroom. But you can flip this. So if I decide the get to, then they decide the how to. But if they decide to, to learn what they want to learn, the get to, then I support the how to. So our, our responsibilities are defined. So an example of this would be this. If I decided to get to, it was geography. What do you know about the earth? These are basic questions. So th this whole slide piece will give you questions that you can ask. What do you want to know about the earth? Where will you find the answers? If you had to teach it to your juniors, what tools would you create? And how are you gonna put this thing together? And then how are we going to work? So they decide, are we going to work as a full classroom? Are we going to work in smaller groups of three and four and five? So they decided at that time to work in groups of four and five. How will we share information? So roles, responsibilities, this whole, what you call community work. This is all part of community building. That's the process that we use. Will we measure ourselves, yes or no first? When they said yes, then they said, okay, how are we going to define the assessments? And they define the assessments, the questions. And then as a teacher, I just put it together and I said, okay, these are your questions. Now go answer them. So they already knew the questions. And it's not as if questions that we put out to students of ours are uh, secret, you know. There's nothing secret about it. So also, how will we manage differences? How are we going to build relationships and so on? So that process. So there is the objective. If you broadly look at it, the get to is the objective. And here's the process. Similarly, now here's the critical piece in the experiential learning cycle. We ask a whole bunch of questions because reflection is a critical part. That's what anything becomes. That's how anything becomes experiential. The question we ask here is, what questions? What happened? What are we interested in about geography? It's not enough to say, oh, I want to learn geography and I want to learn about the earth. Not good enough. 
what exactly are we interested in? What information do we need? What permissions do we need? What do we want to know? So the whole... So yes, the earth is sinking and there's pollution and you can choose one of these subjects and actually do this. So our job is to raise these questions, is to frame these questions and ask these questions. What are we inviting? We're inviting thinking. We're inviting exploration. And we're inviting reflection. So reflection is, you know, my past. I also bring my past into my present and I take it into the future. So reflection is all that. The second piece is, piece is so what? The so what questions are designed to help build a connection between what we are learning, what we have discovered through the what questions, and to connect it to our lives. So an example would be this. So what if we learn about this topic? I mean, what's the value of it? What's the value of learning economics, physics, chemistry, biology? What's the value of learning about the circulatory system? And the moment you ask that question, you're saying, hey, you know what? If I, if, if I find somebody bleeding, I find somebody in an accident, I should know what to do. And that's the context. Until that context is built, nobody knows what to do when there is a bleed or somebody is hurting or, you know, there's an accident. So what is the so what question's intention is you build a generalization that when there is an accident, what happens? somebody might be injured. So what if somebody is injured? So you build a generalization. When somebody is injured, you do A, B, C. Are you getting this? Hopefully you are. <laughs> so you build the meaningfulness into this. You build a hypothesis. So uh, for example, I'm just taking an accident. The experience was seeing an accident. The what questions is what, so what are you going to do? So what happened? The person uh, fell off the scooter or fell off a ladder. Okay, so what are you going to do now? I'm going to, in first aid, they tell you not to move the person. So I'm going to check ABC. There's an ABC in first aid and I'm going to check ABC. So what am I going to do? This is what I'm going to do. What's the hypothesis? Check airway, breathing, circulation, for example, and I'm going to make the connections now. If there is an airway block, great, take it out. If there is a breathing problem, whatever it is, solve it. If there's a circulatory problem, and then you take it to, oh, okay, now you know what's happened. Now what are you going to do? So in the context of geography, it would be, what shall we do with this knowledge? So an example would be, uh, next time I go for a trek, I'm going to I'm going to look at the uh, the way mountains formed, or uh, the way there are mountains and there are gullies and there is there are different types of rocks. I'm going to make those connections. Where are trees growing more? Where are the trees shorter? And so on and so forth. So whether it's geography or anything that we do, any topic, these three questions are critical. What? So what, now what? <clears throat> and the now what is what helps application and practice and invites them to take their learning into action. Ta-da! I'm done. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, you possibly didn't see us interacting that much, but I think these are also things that, you know, you, uh, that makes you think. And I think that is as important as sort of, you know, participating uh, right away because, you know, it gets you thinking about things, not necessarily things one hasn't been, you know, been, uh, uh, you know, engaging with, okay, but perhaps in a more uh, constructive manner, in a more meaningful manner. So thank you for this very, very interesting session where sort of, you know, I hope uh, all of us are uh, thinking <clears throat> in terms of, especially given the times that we are where there is 
you know, the experience of teaching has become absolutely minimal. So I hope sort of, you know, that uh, uh, we, you know, we get something from this. And when we do go back to our classrooms, hopefully soon enough, we, will, we can sort of bring some of this to the classroom. Uh, I would request people to please post their questions uh, in the chat box. But in the meantime, just to sort of, you know, uh, begin the conversation. Uh, I would like to sort of you know, just say that, you know, uh, looking at what, uh, you know, you had to share, uh, I guess a lot of it is also subject dependent. Uh, so I wouldn't know if you know, a physics teacher or, you know, somebody who teaches, uh, uh, you know, uh, commerce uh, is able, you know, how they do it. But in literature, we do a lot of this. Uh, I teach English, uh, therefore, sort of, you know, I'm speaking about my subject. We are constantly trying to relate what they are studying with what is happening in the world around. So obviously, it's not a full scale uh, engagement with, with the world in, in, in every which way, like you have said, but still, I think there is a lot of connect that we try and build between the texts that they are studying and the world around you know we talk about whether there are movements whether suppose i'm teaching an african-american writer immediately connected with you know things like black lives matter or even something they are watching on netflix or whatever so you know that they're that kind of they can bring in their own experience and you know and uh, I think it, it becomes a lot more possible and we do sort of, I think, make it uh, in that sense, you know, a more experiential. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm sensing that a lot of that is uh, still cognitive. And sometimes when you can, when you can take a play and uh, theaterize it, or you take a play, or you take a poem, and then you uh, break it up, and you know, make slips. I'm just giving you an example of uh, things that can be done <clears throat> uh, that will be a little more hands-on is to make slips of uh, each line and then ask them, okay, this is the content. What order would you put it in? And sometimes what emerges is a new meaning of what each sentence and the context. And then, uh, so it goes from understanding a sentence to building a context for the entire poem. And that then becomes a little more meaningful. So uh, just uh, something that you mentioned, you can make almost any subject experiential, almost. I mean, I haven't figured out the calculus piece yet, but apparently it can. I know people who've done it. There's a guy who is constantly converting maths into experiences. So what I'm trying to also uh, let you know is that there's a whole bunch of people doing some brilliant work in in making classrooms, classroom experiences more exciting. And we just have to get into that. So a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, may I start answering them? Yes, please. If you uh, so, class ko manoranjak banane ke liye teacher ko kya upaye apnane chahiye wo aapko ab bahut se tarike hain. Pehla to ye ki before you enter the classroom, please think about who you are. If you don't feel happy, your classroom cannot be entertaining and happy. That's rule number one. Now, this is not intended to be a, you know, a commercial break, but I teach a course that helps educators and trainers uh, take the methodology into their classrooms. You can visit my website if you want and take a look. There's a course starting on the 2nd of October. If it interests you, go, see what you want to do. I'm giving a talk tomorrow just for people who want to know what experiential education is and what the course is about tomorrow at 6 o'clock. But just remember that, I mean, I don't, I don't sell the course. Okay, forget it. Right. Um, the presentation software that I used is called Prezi. So it's like a camera, you know, it's much better than Microsoft PowerPoint. It's, uh, it's called Prezi. Uh, See, here's the thing. Can I ask here's a question? The thing. Yeah. Yes, 
but uh, before the connection goes from my head uh a powerpoint lost it i lost interest in it because i could make my powerpoints more experiential by using this software so there is movement there's flow there's all that stuff so i'm trying to enhance and make this experience of even one by one interaction more exciting yeah go ahead shivan uh, two questions actually one is that uh, the classrooms that we have most of us i mean irrespective of school college wherever you are teaching we have huge classrooms i mean in a, in a sometimes a number of students could go up to even 80 90 in such a scenario how do we bring about experiential teaching uh, is one question and question number 2 given the fact that uh, is it possible to bring experiential teaching even into online mode because this is not restricted to the pandemic uh, we are moving into what they are calling a blended kind of teaching where we would have offline as well as online so how do we bring in experiential teaching into online teaching okay <clears throat> a quick answer um there's a friend his name is chris cavert madhvi if you can put that uh, the details in uh he he's a master at this of uh, uh getting people to do activities even at a remote level so i could have got you to do something individually wherever you are and uh, then i then the zoom is uh, is you know kind of evolving to make it more exciting for you to do so the mentimeter uh that you did is interactive uh you can you can use uh, google slides so i was giving you the poetry example and i do a lot of activities in which uh they called word circle puzzles so if you go to chris cavert's website fundoing.com you'll get a lot of information you and a lot of it he gives away free that's the brilliant thing about him so uh you can go ahead and use that there's a whole bunch of uh, so more than classroom teachers like you you know who's been shaken the most because of the pandemic yeah experiential educators why you mean i can't take people onto a mountain <gasps> then how will i do this and so all the big experiences that were possible now have to be brought onto this one by one screen and it's really hard but uh, it's the field is evolving and uh, if you're interested in experiential methods being used go to aee.org association for experiential education aee Madhvi is, I think, putting it into the chat. dot org, and you get a whole bunch of stuff, a lot of uh, free Zoom webinars, conversations, groups. Uh, you know, learning how to use uh, this methodology remotely. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. It okay. does. Okay. So, if we could, if we Shivani, could... can I share? Yes, please. <clears throat> yes, Priyanka. I'll share some observations. Very truthful to them. I wanted to ask you that: uh, Have you applied this experiential learning? But now, after your presentation and this whole session, answer I got that because it was really so new and you know the way Zoom in and Zoom out and the usage of cartoons that really made it an experiment for me at least. I loved it, and you know I think that made this learning for me full of fun and all. Uh, sir, there is one incident I want to share it with you. Uh, same like students don't turn on the camera, so constantly I was requesting them. Yesterday I requested again, and I said that tomorrow I want to really. Today everyone switch on the camera, and I asked them that okay, in, individually, how are you feeling after looking at the faces of your friends? Uh, like uh, completely like she wanted to say something but then she started crying and uh, I, i really got scared then you know i talked to her after the uh, class and i asked some of the students also to talk to uh, her and it was just the anxiety so you know because they haven't
haven't uh, you know uh, met or they have not been properly introduced to everyone you know, each other so like what should i do I, I really feel bad for her is there something i can help her to overcome this anxiety to you know interact and to you know talk in front of the class on the screen i think that's why you know it's more um, painful for her to talk <clears throat> well one is definitely take that conversation <clears throat> offline so away from the group uh, the very fact that um, uh, she had the courage to do that and then she must have been in a very vulnerable place once uh, the emotion started taking over so to to be able to manage that there's no easy way but you can uh, you know when it happens and it's online and everybody is out there just say hey you know uh, priyanka I, i understand what's going on with you but can we take this conversation let uh, can i give you a call afterwards and can we have a chat and that is kind of a reassuring way of saying i'm not being put down or teased or bullied uh and now the connection has been made and and then so you there's a lot of offline work to be done before you you can become more inclusive of the process in an online session you know uh i uh, i'm very brutal when uh, it comes to cameras on and off i i'll give you an example Okay, there's a whole bunch of messages. Is there any any other questions? No. Okay, now tell me what it feels like. Okay. If I kept talking now, what does it feel like? And if you enjoy it, great. Then let's just conduct classrooms like this, because what they're essentially telling you. if they are not interested then there are other ways that you can you see how uncomfortable it gets okay so if you there are other ways of doing this and i understand that you've got a bunch of learner uh, of people <clears throat> who are you know it's become compulsory and that's fine and that's the truth but please remember one thing you have absolutely no control over whether they learn or not you didn't have it when you were there in person and you don't have it so as we as educators we were to stop believing that we have control over the performance of my students we don't the only thing we have any influence on is how they choose to see you as a person and how they receive you as a person so i would like to emphasize connection before content i mean how much do we know about our students how much do the students know about you and what is this what is this classroom then then why have me i can just put a video on and walk away what's the what's the point okay right if it's just content that's and the other thing to remember google is god they don't need us so for me it offers greater opportunity and I'm, and the question i'm asking is you know if they have access to all the information that i'm going to give them and even more and probably more exciting presentations in you know on the web what can i pay attention to that will invite them to be interested if i can focus my attention on how they sense me and the subject then that's that's a better investment i would you know if i was teaching any of the subjects that you guys teach i would just uh, i would i would attend every day but i would leave everything to them let them define how they want to learn and help their then our role as educators 
is to help them build a structure and form for themselves to be able to learn. Because that's how they're going to learn best, not the way I teach. Is this making sense? So yes, why put does. energy in, in, in giving them what they already can get? Let's do something else. There's a question. Can I ask, please? Yes, uh, please. Ajit is asking, Ajit Kumar, are cognition and knowledge different or are they complementary to each other? Is it cognition that leads to knowledge or vice versa? Once your opinion, your inputs on that. Okay. Uh, knowledge is stuff. Cognition is understanding. Or how I receive that stuff. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, we cook every day, right? Now, the stuff that you put into the vessel, let's say you're making uh, paneer sabzi. So you put in the paneer, you put in the aloo, you put in the masala, you put in all that. That's all knowledge. You can get it from the web, right? When you smell it, can you smell it on the web? So that cognition is like being able to get the aroma of that food which you built with knowledge. It becomes personal. Cognition is personal. It's individual. So now, in the context of actually, your question was understanding the nuances of experiential learning. Can I make a paneer ki sabzi so that everybody in the classroom gets something from it? Not everybody will get all of it, right? But somebody will get the aroma. Somebody will get the method of doing it. Somebody will just watch and learn. Somebody will say, nay, nay, this doesn't work for me. I'm going to cut my own aloo and paneer and make it while you're making it. The hands-on style. And these are the different ways of cognition. Ajit, I hope that answers your question. You also got some, I, my chat box is not showing, you got some quite interesting responses when you talked about carrying our emotions to the classroom. A lot of people had, I think, uh, varied responses. Some said you can't be angry in a classroom, you can't carry your emotions into the classroom, whereas some said, no, no, of course you sort of, you know, you do tend to do that. Uh, my personal, uh, you know, uh, exp uh, no, uh, feedback to that would be that we don't necessarily, I don't necessarily carry my personal emotions, but through what we teach, we do encourage, I think, all kinds of a range of emotions. You do find students sometimes getting very angry about things or sort of, you know, uh, having a good time, happy about certain things. So that is, I think, how, you know, uh, so far engagement in terms of emotion. Yeah, but uh, Shivani, imagine you're angry or you're sad on a particular day and you walk into the classroom. Do you think you can generate joy in the classroom? No, possibly not. So here's a quote that I often use. Consciously, we teach what we know. Unconsciously, we teach who we are. So when I walk into the classroom, my, conscious, my consciousness may be in the, in the content, but unconsciously, I'm sending vibrations of whatever I'm feeling and how I'm dealing with it, and who I am emerges through that. So think of your favorite teacher that you've ever had. I wonder what it was. Do you think it was a subject or it was who they were? I think a combination of both, who they okay, were. They, you know, Shivani, uh, I want you to commit. Don't stand on the, on the wall 
No, because saying, I don't I'm, have... I'm not saying it's not a combination. No, no, it I'm is a saying, combination for me, I think. Uh, no, I'm not saying it's not. Yeah. I'm saying uh, when you answer so quickly, I'm saying, huh, you know what? Give it five minutes. And when you replay that, a different truth emerges. So cognitively, you responded. And now I want to want you to respond effectively, and you'll see that the answer will change. <laughs> Maybe. So Ajit, that's your cognition story. So I think we are all, all I think out of time because uh, the next session begins at uh, one thirty and they have a break. So thank you, Mr. Parchure, very much for this extremely engaging uh, conversation. Uh, I think it has made us think more in terms of not just you know how we bring experience into the classroom, how we make our classrooms a more holistic, uh, how learning a more holistic experience, I think. Uh, I hope you're able to achieve a little bit of what you are trying to, you know, talk about here in our classrooms. It's it's a difficult proposition. Uh, I don't see it as easy, but I think we'll all try a little harder to achieve this. And it's not uh, difficult. I'm I'm doing it, and I have about a thousand students across the country who uh, uh, who experienced it. I think uh, I think it's immensely possible. And I think for us as educators to go out there and do something and not just be deliverers of content would be the most respectful thing we did for ourselves. Yeah, that's true. Sorry. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you, Madhavi. Uh, thank you to all the participants. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, would Vinita, would, would you like to sort of make an announcement?